Are you there, Brian? We, hey, we got him, y'all. Hello, Brian. Pinky. Pinky. Yes. Flip the switch. Pinky, flip. Flip the flag. Flip the switch. Oh, flip the, the flag and plow the, yes. plow the field and flow the blick and pluck the, yeah. Oh, Lord, I can't believe this. Oh, this is my, this made my day. I have Pinky, Look. Pinky and the brain on right now. Welcome everybody to another Double Toasted interview. I am Corey Coleman, and you know whenever we do these interviews, we don't do them for anybody. We're always having somebody special on, somebody that I'm usually I'm close to their work or I'm a big fan of the person. And before I introduce this person, let me just say this. Today, a lot of people, and this weekend, a lot of people are going to be celebrating the return of something very special to them. A lot of people are and have been eagerly awaiting the return of Animaniacs. Animaniacs. I've tried online dating, but I keep getting catfished. How do I know she's even real? But you can't have the return of Animaniacs without the return of Pinky in the Brain. And I'm honored to have the brain himself right here, Mr. Maurice LaMarche. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, my friend. When I take over the world, Corey, you shall be spared. <laughs> this is what I love about having, and this is what I love and hate about having these voice people over, because they do the voices, and then I lose all professionalism when I get excited when they do it, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, glad to knock you off your professionalism. You, you could at least give me like a couple of minutes, man, to be professional. You didn't have to come in and do that, but I love it. And I just got through telling Maurice, uh, looking sexy... With that turtleneck, man. Love a good turtleneck. Thank you. I'm working on my Robert Wagner impression from the 60s. <laughs> beautiful, baby. Beautiful. And I always get dressed up in costume whenever I do an impression. <laughs> Actually, the truth of the matter is, I'm going to be honest, because I think I, I, I follow the Howard Stern dictum, honesty is everything in radio and broadcasting. I have a, I've had a, an outbreak of, of pimples on my neck like I'm 15 again. I don't know why. So I'm wearing a turtleneck. Cover all that crap up. Oh, going through your second teenager phase man that's nice yeah that means you're I young at heart two, and um, I'm, I'm having a second adolescence right now there you yes. go man <laughs> probably it's with the return of animaniacs it's making me feel like a kid hey man so. 30 years later yeah as long as yeah. you're getting them up here and not down there you're good man <laughs> <laughs> uh i don't have to tell a lot of you people out there about how this man practically raised you in front of a screen as you watched many of the shows that he did where he did the voice work. I mean, this, it, 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 I, the only thing I feel like I'm doing bad here is that I can't just spend as much time talking about every one of these characters that you have done. Of course, you've, uh, you've, you've done some things such as you've won Emmys. You won two Emmys for Futurama. I did. I did. I'm very, I'm very, uh, I still don't know how the hell that happened. They're they're right they're right up there in my, in my I'll put the camera on them for two seconds. They're right up there in my office. It's, uh, it's nice did, to did win. It's nice to win two of them for balance, man. You can like have them as yeah. uh, bookends. Looks you nice on the it, show. What's, you know what's 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 fun though is that they're there, but the very center one is the one that little loving cup is one my son gave me uh, when he was four. And it just says, happy birthday to my daddy. And he emphasized my, like my daddy. <laughs> and, and to me, that's that's the set front and center award. That's that's the most important award. Family Trump's Emmys. Sorry, Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> yeah, I don't, <laughs> but, I don't, I don't think you're not, you're not made for L.A., man. You're too nice of a guy. <laughs> Well, I, I, and, and I still, like, as I say, I, I feel like everybody in the cast should have gotten one before me. I mean, come on, Billy West, John DiMaggio, Katie Seagal. Uh, there's, I mean, their, their performances were so awesome during the run of the show. And and I, I don't know how it landed on me, but I'm, I'm flattered and I'll take it because 
you know, it, it messes with my low self-esteem. And anytime I can do that, it's a good thing. <laughs> well, I'm sure all of those people you just named, they would say, you know, just shut the hell up and take it. You, you wow. earned it. You, you, you got that for a reason, which you that did. Is what they, that, that is what they said when I, you know, when we came back uh, – uh, the, the day after the Emmys, they said, "Shut the hell up and take it." Exactly. Those <laughs> um, Very supportive uh, friends. <laughs> yeah, right. man. Yeah. And no, you do um, the, the the voice work community is is incredible. You know, I've talked to some other people before, and it's just and everybody's it's like you that they're, they're so humble and they're so nice, man, and they're so appreciative. Well, it, I, Corey, I think it's I think it's a function of the fact that I think we find the work. We go into that work maybe because we don't have as big egos. I don't know. I've still got me an ego. There's no question. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's okay. The characters can be the stars. I'm glad. I'm glad to be a part of something like the brain, with Pinky and the brain, the fact that I get to be this character that people remember from their childhoods that, mm -hmm. like <laughs> – He's my child brain. I mean, of all the characters I've done, brain is the one that I feel like I, I birthed him. Even though I use an Orson Welles uh, and a little bit of Vincent Price, imp Price impression for him, mm -hmm. he's he's from me. I, I hate to say he's a lot of the bad things about me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I, I can be a bit of a controlling guy, especially like at home and mm -hmm. especially in the kitchen. Uh, I've got, you know, I can be. I've got. I've got like home megalomania. Megalomania, uh, but you know he and and he's just. But he's got this warm spot for Pinky that he can't show, and <laughs> that endears him to me so much because he, he loves he loves Pinky and I love Rob Paulson, and you know. But he he just can't show it, and I think a lot of us are stuck in that with somebody in our lives. Um, Anyway, I just I feel very lucky to be part of the a part of this and the and, and the fact that this is coming back after all this time and getting to play in that sandbox again is is, is a blessing. Yeah, I mean, how does it feel returning to that uh, after thirty years? You say he was with you the whole time, but to come back into the voice again after thirty years, how is that? Well, I, I think I sound more like Orson Welles now than I did when I was <laughs> in my forties. So voice has dropped a little bit in the past twenty seven years. So when you hear the show, uh, which, you know, we're, we are uh, we're doing a Twitter watch party at six o'clock mm -hmm. tonight. I don't have the hashtags for it, unfortunately, <clears throat> uh, but I'm sure if you do a little search on who I think Hulu, if you follow Hulu and, and do our Twitter watch party, we're watching the first episode and, and we'll be commenting. Um, but, um, you know, to get to play with these people again and. The scripts are just as good, a little edgier. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a new creative team, and I love and miss the original creative team with all my heart. But uh, the new creative team has stepped up to the challenge, and um, there's just a bit more of an edge because we're in a different era now, and uh, especially Pinky and the Brain. 22 years have passed, and Brain has not taken over the world. <laughs> he, he's a tad pissed about it. If you don't mind my saying so. No, and I can I can tell. He was pissed back then when he couldn't take over the world. I can only imagine he's, how he feels he's now. Cranky. He's a crankier brain <clears throat> than, than, than your dad's brain. Oh, you should see the people in the chat talking about, I love this guy. You are my hero, Mr. Lamarche, people are saying. Uh, Thank you. you know, everyone knows the characters that that I've listed off, that I've shown, that we've talked about in the short time that we've been on. Uh but the amount of work that you've done is so impressively huge. You are one of those guys where you go back and look at things. You're like, oh, wait a minute. You you did that? Uh, one of my... I, I go back occasionally and, and look at my IMDb and go, wait a second. I did that? <laughs> yeah. I did. And I, it's all just been a function of, of showing up, mm -hmm. you know, doing my best that I can in audition and in performance, and not dying in the past, you know, 35 years, <laughs> you, build up, uh, you build up an IMDb listing like 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 I have. And by the way, I don't have the longest one. Uh, you know, Rob Paulson's is longer than mine. 
I, I just felt very, very dirty saying that. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I thought it, but I didn't say anything. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, Frank Wilker, I think, has the second longest IMDb listing. Uh, Mel mm-hmm. Blanc has the longest. Uh, Mel Blanc... He Mel Blanc overtook him from the grave because somebody really devoted to Mel Blanc dug up every single thing he did and posted it on IMDb. Yeah. But there was a time for a very long time that Frank Welker had the longest IMDb, the IMDb listing of any actor or any performer, uh, any anybody in the internet movie database. I suddenly became William Shatner. <laughs> And I think William Shatner also wore that outfit that she had right now one time. <laughs> it's very isn't it? Yeah, no, it was, and I love. I'll show you my outbreak. No, I, lo- I love the uh, mid-century modern cool man. Uh, you know, Thank you, baby. <laughs> and the attitude to go with it. You know, one of the things I was going to mention that I saw that uh, I looked at, it's like, wow, you even you even a part of that? I don't know how many people remember this movie from back in the 80s, but it was one of my favorite movies as far as being an underground classic, cult classic film, uh, Rock and Roll. Rock and Roll. Hot music. The best of times. And Maurice LaMarche. You know, you, I want to put the character that you were in there because, I, like I said, I love this movie. Man, I know it's a crazy movie. I can't even say it's great, but I love it. You are the voice of a character that actually... I, it's one of my favorite lines in the movie just because of the way you said it. You played the sailor. And I have to say, you have one of the, as far as last lines go uh, uh, for a death scene, you you had that. Uh, I'm going to play that. You played a guy who was like a, an informant for the villains. And uh, something you did to piss them off made them turn around and kill you. And you had a great departing line. They're looking for your little sister. Oh, now we're even, right? Get off my back. Oh, shit. I have to say, that is the that is my favorite oh shit or oh shit ever in any kind of movie, man. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you, I think I was twenty two, maybe when I when I recorded. I I was, I, I, I still could do a French Canadian accent with some authenticity because I hadn't <laughs> I hadn't uh, I just crossed over uh, the border and and moved here, but I I'd forgotten that I did him with a with a French Canadian accent. That's funny. Oh, my God. I'm talking about – I mean, that's one of the very first jobs I ever did. Uh, Nelvana was the very first company to put me in anything animated. And they did it with uh, 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 something called uh, Easter Fever where I uh, – we roast the Easter Bunny played by uh, <laughs> Morris. And I played Don Rickles and Steve Martin as a rattlesnake and a horse. And, what? Um uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 22 at the time so that was an amazing piece of voice work to 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 do at 22 can you do the french canadian accent now well uh, now i do it a little deeper there i do uh, Im- imitation of uh, mon oncle uh many of my uncles my father uh, lose his french canadian <laughs> accent when he uh, went into broadcasting there eh? for a little while my dad was on the television uh, in Ottawa and in Timmins, Ontario. And he, he do uh, the news, the weather, the sport. But uh, his brother all talked like this. And my, my father did this. <laughs> this was Canadian, uh, sort of uh, sophisticated. He and Alex Trebek actually worked together the, oh, really? in, in Ottawa. <clears throat> great Alex Trebek. They, they, uh, shared, uh, they shared a, a makeup chair. And my father would do the news weather and sports at 6.30 in French on the French channel, but Peter Jennings and Alex Trebek would do the news, weather, and sports uh, on the English channel from 6 to 6.30. Oh. So, yeah, my dad did decide, decided it wasn't for him, though, after that. He, he didn't stick with it. But Jennings, Trebek, eh, whatever happened to those guys? No, I'm kidding, man. No, <laughs> and they, they were amazing broadcasters. Did you ever meet uh, Alex Trebek yourself or I, Peter Jennings? A couple times, and I'm friends with his daughter, Nikki. Uh, but I did meet uh, Alex uh, uh, once at, in in line at a restaurant, and and <laughs> and it was it was uh, it was just kind of cool because I dropped my father's name and he did remember him. He was always a gentleman, um, and I would send after I got to know Nikki, I would just send messages back to tell Alex that Guy's son says hello, and uh, yeah, I, I don't you know I know Alex had nothing to do with the questions and answers of the research. <laughs> On the show, but I was an answer, and, and not just the character of Brain. 
my name, Maurice Lamarche, because he would say it with a proper French Canadian uh, intonation. He would like draw out of English and into French because he was bilingual. And and he, whenever my name came up as an answer on Jeopardy, uh, it, it was it just was such a thrill to me that I was I knew I'd arrived in show business when I became an answer on Jeopardy. At what point? Did you realize that you're no longer just a voice actor? You are you are a celebrity. You know you're a name now. Was it the the, the Jeopardy I, moment? I, I, I was kidding about arriving in show business. It's like a, one of those little like, <laughs> funny, you know, humorous pats on the back. I don't ever think of myself as a celebrity. I'm I'm stunned when anybody recognizes me. Um, you know, on the street, to me, a celebrity is somebody who can't eat their dinner in peace because people are coming up. I went out for dinner with John Lovitz when we started doing the Critic and the, the, for the first time, and we went to this little Lebanese restaurant and we're just trying to get through our, our meals. Just him and me. We just recorded the critic and like about our third episode. And this guy comes up with his kids and has the kids ask for the autograph. And he goes, are they, are they old enough to know the show? You know, no, oh, yeah, I make them watch it all the time. And then, you know, then, the, then, then they just kind of come back and stare at him. And then another young couple comes up and asks for the autograph, and it's hard for us to get through our dinner. And at the end of the dinner, John turns to me and goes, well, Maurice, that's what it's like to be famous. Are you sure you want it? <laughs> and I, you know what? It really was a lesson to me. It's like, you know what? I'll be okay if I just make a decent living and can eat my dinner in peace. Um, and I describe myself as having won the lottery on, on the 26 annual payments. You know, instead of the big lump sum, I've had a long and very grateful for it, a very long career, uh, making a very nice living year to year to year to year. And, and it adds up to a lottery win. So let me just <laughs> let me just keep doing that. No, uh, you <laughs> another 40 years and then I can retire at 102. <laughs> hey man that, you know what that would be a great living if you if you were to make it that far you truly have won because you've won now i mean i love when people say that because i think that you're right being able to do a uh, voice work like this and reap the benefits of success without having to you know deal with what you just said you know people hounding you and whatnot i've always found that that is a, a an excellent way to live life man you're very fortunate and and and, and by the way i'm always flattered if anybody ever recognizes me and when we do the comic cons it's very touching to find out how uh, our work has affected people. And we get a, every time Rob and I do a Comic-Con, we get stories of people who, watching Animaniacs, got them through uh, you know, their cancer treatments or got them through, I remember the first time it happened, a young lady came over and said, my mother died uh, and, uh, of cancer, and my father and I walked around for about a year completely in just shock. But every day at 4.30, we sat down and watched Pinky and the Brain, and that was our time to laugh. And we'd sit on the couch and just laugh and enjoy the show and then go back to kind of cooking in silence and eating in silence. But that was our oasis. And and I, a story like that comes to me every time I do an appearance. Um, so while I don't pretend that I am this altruist who started out to make this you know the, the this wonderful project that would relieve pain. I mean that is the that is the function of all entertainment. We're in the mm -hmm. business of helping you forget your problems, and, and that's what it is for me. I'm a consumer of entertainment, but you know I also know. Hey, you know you were just an actor trying to make your trying to make your your rent when you made those cartoons. It doesn't matter. The net effect, along with the eighty seven. You know, animators and, and, and writers and producers and cell wipers and, you know, the whole staff that makes the show. The net effect was one of it helps people. And I feel honored to have been a part of it, even if I'm, you know, not the not the, the, the Dalai Lama of cartoons. You know, um, I just I just am, I'm glad to have been a part of it. You know, your first voice acting gig, I believe, was in 1983. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. At the time you were doing uh Inspector Gadget, and I got a little little bit of a of an example of that right I here. I suspect could be our arch nemesis, Doctor Claw, using a clever alias. That was from Gadget and the Gadgetinis, Gadgetinis. Uh, they were the, the little junior robots that were based on Gadget. They were just a little smarter than him. <laughs> but they still managed to get into trouble. 
Um, I played all three. I played Gadget and the two Gadgetinis, Fidget and Digit. And that was that was an that was an interesting project because Don Adams had retired, uh, and he with totally with his blessing. In fact, he even said, "Get Mo to do me. He does me better than I do." I'd done the original series with Don, and it was the first U.S. gig I ever had. The the Rock and Roll and the two uh, uh, half hour uh, network specials that uh, Nelvana had done. Uh, in, in out of Toronto were my earliest work, and that the the, the first the TV specials I did while I was still living there. Um, but when I got here, it took me a little while to get to get up and running with the animation thing. I was doing stand up, and that was paying the bills. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you know, I, I actually thought, well, I, I the one inroad I had to animation is back in Canada, and I've left Canada, so. I guess that's going to be it. And then I got in on uh, on a few things with uh, uh, with Deke Entertainment. I've done um, uh, The Littles and something called Wolf Rock TV, where I actually got to work with Wolfman Jack, the real Wolfman Jack. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then and then uh, Gadget came along, and I got to play Henchman Number 1 and, <laughs> uh, and the Chief, uh, Chief, Chief Quimby. So I did 26 episodes alongside Don. And I really got to not only get friendly with him, but I also got to kind of really take him in as a subject of of, um, of doing an impression of him. Because when you played that back for me just now, even I kind of went, hey, that's pretty good. You know, and, and I, I don't mean, I mean that to sound egotistical, but because I'm hard on myself. But I also give myself credit when I do something right. And that that gadget was, well, that was kind of cool. I, I almost thought it was Don for a second. No, um, no. So um, you don't need to compliment me. I'll just compliment myself, Corey. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> Are you there, Brian? We, hey, we got him, y'all. Hello, Brian. Pinky, Pinky, yeah. flip the switch. Pinky, flip, flip the plug. Flip the switch. Oh, flip the, the plug and plow the, yes. plow the field and flow the blick and flip the, yeah. Pink pop. Flip us. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Hello, Brian. Oh. Sure. Hot, 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 Oh Nerd. my! Oh Run my! The baby buggy bumpers. Hey, Dad! Toy boat, toy boat. Unique New York. Ah. <laughs> oh, oh Lord! I can't believe this. Oh, this is my. This made my day. I have Pinky, no. Pinky, and the brain on right now. This is a. This is an incredible moment for me, y'all. I am so happy to be here with these two. The- brain, look, Corey's lowered his journalistic standards for both you and me. I- <laughs> Plus, you at least pulled over while you drink, Pinky. Oh, are you dri- are you driving, Brain? Because as no. I recall, you don't you don't so much drive as aim, um, yeah. as you've gotten older. Yes. So. <laughs> the chat is going crazy right now. Oh. I'm going crazy. Did this you go the tube to start the car, or are you all right now? Is that over with? Me? <laughs> oh yeah, I am. I'm. I'm. I finally um. See what am I doing? I'm actually in San Simeon. In my car outside a paint store because I'm working on uh, our little vacation place, and very excited about the fact that Corey has uh, allowed you and uh, subsequently yours truly to um, regale the audience about what's happening tomorrow. Boy. What? <laughs> what are we doing tomorrow, Pinky? The same thing we do every, once every 25 years: launch Pinky and the Brain again. No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh! This is uh, this is an incredible moment for the people out there, but especially for me. I am, I was honored before, but I cannot believe that this is happening right now. Uh, you two, thank you so much for doing this. This is a, this is a, this is a gift, is what it is. Um, you know, this is incredible what you what you two are doing because I read how a while back, Rob, how when you were in chemotherapy, uh, mm-hmm. Maurice came to visit you at that time. Uh, yeah, he didn't just come to visit me, Corey. Um, Mo improved my life. And he does um, He does anyway because of just the kind of man he is. Um, look, there are a lot of really talented people in Hollywood. It's not a big deal. What is a big deal is having people whose, you know, undeniable, provable, demonstrable, prodigi- prodigious skill is eclipsed utterly by their heart and their humanity. And I'm telling you, 
uh, that young man on the other end of the Skype call um, is is way more than a dear friend. He really is. He truly is. Um, uh, I, I love Maurice LaMarche. Who doesn't? But when you get a chance to uh, to have him in your life like this, it's um it's a really big deal, Corey. I'm so glad you brought that up. Oh. No, no, I'm and I, I'm almost moved to tears by that. You know, I I gotta say. And you just got on, Rob. So I don't I don't want to bring things down here. But, you know, uh, you both have suffered tragedies. Uh, just like oh, I brought up God. some things about about you, uh, Rob, and what you've done in the past. Uh, Maurice, you know, you had a, 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 a career going before you did voice work. You were doing comedy. And it's funny because some of the comedy clips that I have right here that I found they were almost showing that you were how you were destined to do voice work at one time. This is a, a oh, special. That, yeah. Yeah. This is a special you did with Rod, where Rodney Dangerfield brought you on and you just went into immediately doing these rapid fire impressions. People ask me, how did you get started doing impressions? A lot of television when I was a kid. Natasha, we must get Moose and Squirrel. Come for him, fuck a tash. Come along, Chumley. Dirty Tennessee. <laughs> you know, I look at that and Isn't that something that that that's a, that's amazing and you know i look that at is. And, and 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 so at the time uh we already talked about how you know some of your vo- your first voice acting gigs and whatnot at the time were you even thinking that this would voice work would be a thing or was comedy always the plan well comedy was the original plan but but voice work began making its way in there i was doing uh i was already doing gadget around the time that uh the, 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 the young comedian that that's from the ninth annual young comedian special. So I, I, I'd already done a couple of things. I think I was starting on gadget or would be starting on gadget soon. And it was always something that, that, you know, Frank Welker was a friend before gadget. Uh, he, hang, he, we all hang out in the same little clutch of, of, uh, of, of, of friends. Howie Mandel, uh, had, you know, kind of brought him into our little group. So Frank knew me for about a year before I got my first job, and Rob will attest to this. Frank Welker is one of the only people who will recommend other actors for a job yeah. they've already gone to him for. And he'll say, no, 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 no. You, you know what? You want Rob Paulson for that. He does that much better than you. <laughs> he'll give up the job he so will. that somebody else will, who's better will do it. He's got such confidence that you know, and he knows how how good he is, and he knows that there's enough work to go around, and the right job will come around to him. So you know, he'd been talking me up for a year at that point to casting directors like Ginny McSwain and Marsha Goodman and Andre Romano, and you know, I'd I'd finally get jobs, and they'd say, "Oh, you're the guy Frank Walker's been telling us about." So that's how, that was my intro. Yeah, to Frank business. Frank's like that. He's just a he's kind of the best of us, and we we've always kind of looked up to Frank as uh, how to behave when you're a grown-up cartoon person. That's a bit of an oxymoron, <laughs> yeah. but you see our point. Uh, and we're lucky. We're so glad he's back on Animaniacs. I mean, he's Yes! Well- <laughs> Frank oh. Welker. You know, a lot of the... We have a, a young audience, and I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with Frank Welker, but... Megatron. Yep. Baby, he's Megatron. Um, he's Well, right now, he's doing the voice of Curious George on the, the show for PBS. And he's doing, um, you look uh, him up on IMDb and it looks like the Manhattan phone book. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. He's the Garfield now after Lorenzo Music passed. He's, right. he's not the voice of Garfield. He was Slimer on Ghostbusters with yeah. Scooby Doo. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I put, a, put a picture up there. And, you know, I, I, with the way you're talking about Frank Welker, the, the way you, you, you guys are talking about each other, uh, is this normally how the voice work community is 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 it this supportive all the way around i think so i think you know i, I was start i kind of started to answer that uh, that issue a little bit earlier i just think that we're, we've got a, a a little less ego i guess because our faces aren't involved yeah. you know it's hmm. just about the work and you know we're not trying to get in you know make sure we stay in the key light or any of that stuff we're just really honoring the work and we know it's it's you know, if I don't get it, I hope Rob Paulson gets the right, job right. or I hope Dee Bradley Baker gets the job. We see each other at auditions. You know, my wife used to do daytime used to do, uh, soaps. And I mean, she's got stories of actresses trying to trip each other up and yeah, yeah. You know, just being 
uh, terrible. And, you know, I think that's it's just all a function of ego that you just don't get to have. I mean, if you've got an ego, you really don't last in our end of the business. Yeah. In our little corner, uh, the, the voiceover corner, people that come in there with huge, you know, entitlement and, and you know, self, uh, self-love, uh, self-servingness, just they don't, they don't get very far. Yeah, it's um, Mo said it beautifully. Uh, it's I don't think that we know anybody who's so talented that they can be a complete jerk. Um, <laughs> and also, when you do know people like Frank, Tress, um, McNeil, uh, Jess, you know Billy West, um, yeah, as D-, D. Bradley Baker, on and on and on, um, it, they are so freaking talented and utterly devoid of pretense and then you get to work with a guy like steven spielberg and you see how he moves through his life uh and he could behave any way he wants <laughs> and he chooses to be a really decent yeah. guy and so there steven, really is no steven makes you feel like you're the only person in the room yep when we're talking to him He's not, he has none of that, you know, looking around, see if anybody more important walked into the party. It's like he is with you and he yep. is talking right to you. And he remembers, yep. he remembers conversation from two years ago. The, you know, I mean, he just picks up where you left off. Really He's something. Amazing yeah. guy, an amazing brain inside that man. So, yeah. When, yeah, when you talk about Steven Spielberg as being producer on, uh, uh, on the show, uh, you know, a lot of people think, all right, you know, producer, maybe he's uh, maybe he's putting his name on it and he's maybe he'll have a word or two. But oh, he's just yeah. sitting back and co- collecting a check for this. Uh, but it make you, you make it sound like that he was very hands on with the uh, with, well, with the with the show. Wellesley will say what well, Wellesley will tell us, you know, yeah. Stephen loved this script. Stephen loves the look of the show. Stephen yeah. sees every script. Stephen signs off on absolutely everything. You know, Wellesley is. Wellesley is, is running the show in the sense that the day-to-day of it, and, you know, certainly he's got a great sense of comedy. Wellesley's the, our showrunner. Uh, he's the captain. Steven's the admiral. But Steven is definitely hands-on and oh, yeah. it's happening without his approval. And, uh, Corey, the reboot was never going to happen, uh, A, unless Steven Spielberg and Sam Register, president of Warner Brothers Animation, decided it was going to. But moreover, uh, it was never going to happen, uh, according to Stephen, unless Maurice, Tress, Jess, and yours truly were in. Um, it's not about having, you know, as P- as Maurice says often, <laughs> Peter Dinklage as the brain and, and Russell Brand as Pinky. Um, and it's, you know, we're fans of both of those fine actors, but it's not about having a celebrity. It's about authenticity. And, yeah. and yeah. this was Mr. Spielberg's call long before any deals were done. And you mentioned, you know, puts his name on it and collects the check. Obviously, he is a brand, but he doesn't need to collect the check. It's not about the money at that level. Yeah. It's about what, you know, another way to bring joy to millions. And and ain't nobody knows how to do it better than Mr. Spielberg. Yeah, he really, he really is a craftsman, a storyteller. He's, yeah. He's- <clears throat> Uh, you know, and that's great to hear because I've always wondered, you know, because it's varying involvements for producers on things. It's great to hear that he's at heart. He's still a creative. You know, that's 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 amazing. Oh, yeah. Um, I think that's part of his DNA. I mean, that's all he does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, going back to your comedy, uh, Maurice, and this is going to lead to a question for both of you. And like I said, Rob, you come, you, you know, we're having a lot of fun. You came in a great time and I don't want to bring everything down, but I will say this. Uh, Maurice, I remember. At a, back in 85, man, you were you're, you were uh, definitely making a name for yourself in comedy. I remember com- uh, a commercial that you did at the time oh, for Fuji. Fu- yeah, Fu- Fuji videotape. I remember those so clearly. And it was before I met Maurice. And I was just blown away. Oh, my God. No, he's <laughs> he's the real deal. I'm so glad you brought that up, Corey. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to show people. I was showing people a little bit of it while you guys were talking. I'm going to show you uh, how he brought these talents to the commercial. Again, oh, known yeah. for his his rapid fire impressions. And this is a commercial, and he does so many during this time. Here's the commercial right here. They forward and reverse it hundreds of times. Me, 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 me. I'm giving it full power, and she's still holding it together. It's a demanding job. <laughs> Amazing. How about that? 
I I remember when I'm old enough to remember when that came on and, and it, when it aired at the time, and that is such an again an incredible thing to kind of come back around and talk to you about that. You know, you um, at the time your career was up and coming in comedy, and here's where I'm going to bring in a bring the interview down a little bit. But you had some tragedies in your life, Maurice. You had uh, your father was shot uh, in, uh, by a friend. At one time, and then, not um, too long after, you my lost baby sister, uh, who was, uh, you know, um, uh, she was she was born when I was fourteen years old, uh, from my dad's second marriage. Uh, yeah, uh, she was um, one of one of those angels on earth, just the sweetest, kindest human being you could ever meet. She died at eighteen. Uh, she wasn't wearing her seatbelt, and uh, they, they, there was a, just a little moment of distraction as she was playing with the radio. And uh, went over onto the gravel on a country road and flipped the car. But yeah, those two tragedies kind of knocked me off my comedy perch for a little while, you know. And I just, I just really couldn't see myself making people laugh while I was in such pain. And I did turn to uh, drugs and alcohol to kind of, uh, you know, tr- treat that pain. And it was not the right treatment. Uh, if only I'd known talking about it and accepting hugs and, and, and you know, having good friends. Uh, you know, was the answer. But I thought that, uh, you know, as I said, bottle of vodka every other day, you know, it was kind of the answer. And it wasn't. And uh, it took me out. It's funny. With with that, with comedy, uh, it, it's like falling off a bike and not getting back on it for three years. Suddenly you have a phobia about bikes. Uh, I, I couldn't, I could never quite get back. All of a sudden, getting on stage and telling people, you, you know, jokes and humorous stories and putting on skits became this, terrifying thing to me the way it is to 99 percent of the world yeah <laughs> yeah lost my rhythm with it um you know so stand-up comedy was a, a path that i was on and uh and i'd still occasionally wonder you know what would have happened if but those thoughts are kind of useless uh i'm grateful for the life i've got and you know when rob and i get to go on the road and do uh, shtick you know either <laughs> at a comic con or and i hope those days come back to us in the next the you know a couple of years where we you know do the do the the Animaniacs live show mm-hmm. or a Comic Con where we just, where we literally just riff in front uh, of a room of two thousand people you know but you know we've got the acceptance of the audience already because they love Pinky and the Brain and they know that those are our secret identities so you know we can go out there and we can just I hate the word improv. Improv scares the living daylights out of me. I call it messing around with my best friend on stage with me. Who's going to <laughs> it works for me, baby. Anything, if I'm with Rob Paulson, I'm fearless on stage. That's, I guess, the secret of improv, except I only have one improv player I feel safe to do it with, and that's Rob. So I'm just effing around with my pal. <laughs> yeah. And we can do anything. You know, it's the uh, truth. Uh, it, it really is. It's like a superpower. I, I, um, I, you know, I think people have said for years, and we both accept the generous compliment and the spirit in which it's delivered, and they'll say, my God, Pinky and the Brain is one of the great comedy duos of all time. And, and I think that that's probably not hyperbole, but understanding that Mo and I know that it's the characters. We don't draw them. We don't write them. It's <laughs> telling you what. When, when we're together like that, it is effortless. And we really do know how each other move and what we're going to say and what we're going to think. And the truth is we're having more fun than anybody else. Yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> but that comedy do thing, it's a compliment that I can only accept one 87th of. You know, there's, there's terrific right. writers behind that great comedy duo. Yeah. There's incredible artists. Uh, there's fabulous music. <laughs> I mean, there's just so much that comes together to make Animaniacs and Pinky and the Brain what it is, mm-hmm. both like, previous iteration and its current, um, you know, uh, wonderful, wonderful incarnation you're going to see tomorrow. Yeah. Um, that, you know, we, we're very proud of it, but we, and, and yeah, the voice performances are important, but it's just a, just a piece of it. So we are, we are thrilled to be, I'm, I speak for both of us, I, and I don't, oh, that, yes. I, but I know my friend, Mr. Paulson, is, is <laughs> that was the meaning of the word gratitude. We are so lucky to have jumped on board uh, this thing and, and to have been accepted. You know, yeah, it, unbelievable. If, if I may ask, you know, you guys 
it's such a joy to hear about your friendship and you're so happy when you're doing these voices I can see that and you know and you when you're doing these characters you know these are usually comical characters that 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 you're doing uh but as I said, you both had some hardships. Maurice, we talked about yours. Of course, it, you know, Rob Paulson, everybody knows about, you know, the, the cancer that you had. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, how do you, you know, what, how do you keep your spirits up when you're doing these voices? And also, and this is, again, for both of you, is there any part of, uh, of those, those hardships that you bring to these performances, even though these, these, are, these are mostly humorous characters? Well, Morris? I think, you know, one's one as an actor, one's instrument is informed by everything that's ever happened to them. So, you know, there's a depth that uh, that comes to uh, the, uh, you know, even though we're doing comedy, uh, there's a depth that comes to the performances, I think. And because and, and, comedy is for dealing with tragedy. I mean, mm-hmm. we laugh so we won't cry. That's a mechanism that whatever p- power that runs the universe installed in us so we don't use our lose our freaking minds so um the, the idea that you know some some things have happened to us it just attunes us more to the great comedy and tragedy of life mm-hmm. you know and and so i think i'm a better comedian than i was 27 years ago i think i know my way around a, a pause or uh, an arched eyebrow, or 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 just delivering a delivering a, a funny line, and I, I feel Mr. Paulson, my esteemed colleague across the aisle, um, or <laughs> across the <laughs> lot. And someone's pissed with you, man. I heard. Burp. Hey, move. Burp. Burp. Yeah, are you stuck in traffic right now doing this interview? I got to go up and paint Hearst Castle. Burp. Yeah, that's <laughs> right, right. Got to make a living. No, most. Obviously correct, um, and and I think it, it, in my case, uh, tragedy is not even that's not even in the playbook here. M- what Maurice has endured, and others who know what it's like to have, I, I, I mean, it's really difficult to quantify. I, I nobody gets out of here without a couple of dings, Corey. Cor- uh, Maurice has had way more than a fender bender. You know, I I had throat cancer. It was very difficult, uh, but that is the sort of thing that sadly a lot of people have to deal with. Um, however, what happens when one goes through, deals with astonishing grief in Mo's case and, and comes through it on the other side, uh, is that you have this sense of empathy that you never, never would have had were it not for these impossibly difficult circumstances. Um, and so now, when I say to somebody, oh, man, I totally me- I totally get it. I really do. I know what they're going through. It allows me to be a better person. It allows me to be a more empathic, uh, thoughtful individual. And both Mo and, and I, um, regardless of the tragedies, like I said, in my case, it was a tap dance with cancer. Very difficult, but not a tragedy. Um, but... Uh, it enables us to, especially nice people like you, Corey, um, to the extent that folks make a fuss over us. We never know when somebody's going to be watching a show that you've done with Mo and me <laughs> and our stories, uh, you know, Mo's uh, story about how he got through that and is back at the very top of his game, better than he was before with Mr. Spielberg again. It is a wonderfully inspirational thing for people to but, but, see but, that. But I, but I have to say, and you too. You, yes, your cancer was a challenge. Yes, challenge. If if it had beaten you, if it had gotten you, that that's a tragedy. Been. Yeah. But what we what you do now is you help people, and with and these things each are an opportunity for you to bring more experience to helping other people. I've talked and worked with people who've had murder in their lives. Um, right. uh, Rob helps cancer survivors. Uh, you're the spokesman now for head and neck. Uh, Correct. Over for Michael Douglas for head and neck cancer association. Um, you know, I, I, I am. Uh, we're both made stronger by our challenges. Yep. If we don't take them and put them back out of the world, take what we've learned to 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 help our brothers and sisters in the human family, 
Right. And that I, in my opinion, shame on me. So uh, absolutely. And Mo and I absolutely are cut from the same cloth. And I think that's why we love each other. But uh, he's right. And, and what he won't tell you, of course, is AA is anonymous for a reason. But I don't even know how to tell you how many times I've been with Mo on the road. I said, Robbie, hang on a second. I, I'll, I'll, I'll meet you downstairs in a, for dinner in a bit. I got to I got to call a young man or a young woman who's, uh, you know, who needs a sponsor, who's, I'll take care of it. But I mean, he, and I, and Mo would be the first to tell you, of course he does. A lot of people do, um, because that's what they do. And the truth is that after you go through something that is a deep challenge or a deep tragedy, it, uh, gives you a privilege. It is nothing short of a privilege to be in a position in which you can make a difference in someone's life. It's not about a paycheck. We've both been rich. We've both been poor. Rich is better. But <laughs> the opportunity. One of us is not about to poor, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but the I'm opportunity. The pandemic. What the hell was I thinking? What's going wow. on. You know, but the opportunity to make a difference in someone's life over and above playing in Hollywood with Steven Spielberg and Sam Register and. Wellesley Wilde and Gabe Swar and Julie and Steve Bernstein, all these world-class talents, that's our job. But the, the, the responsibility of being a human is different, and it's something we can all do. You don't have to be famous, sort of famous, quasi-famous, infamous. <laughs> it's about being a decent human. And, um, yeah. and, and so, like Mo said, shame on us if we don't do that. Just go help somebody. That's, 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 that's it. That's, that's the message. Yeah. It's, you know, you feel wow. it. It's, you know, uh, when when you're feeling down, when you're feeling that you know the world's again, go help someone else. And so go go do something for someone. Uh, call Period. a friend who's depressed and say how you doing. So call somebody in the hospital, you know, and say how you feeling. Or Period. this recovering. It's amazing how you get out of yourself, and that's not just for recovering alcoholics. No, everybody. You know. You know, I got to tell you, this started out very fun. Got emotion a little bit, and I and everybody talks about how they love your work, they love the characters that you do. But at the end of this, this became so influential to a lot of people. A lot of people looking at this, and they said, "Man, this got so positively deep at the end." And people have I've I've said I've seen people in the chat talking about they're crying at the friendship oh. they see going on right now with you two. You almost you're bringing me on the verge of tears almost. Uh, I, you know, I could spend all day well, talking. Well, you know what that is, Corey? That's because there's nothing sadder than two old men trying to be relevant. That's why. <laughs> hey, well, make room for one more, man. I'm almost 50, so, you know. <laughs> You're almost 50. Oh, I'd oh, give everything to be 50 again. Mo and I, you know, Mo and I were the entertainment at the Last Supper. So hey, I know about <laughs> Jesus, I'm all right now, but last week I was in rough shape, you know. <laughs> I did well, some, let me I do this over here. Hey, hey I'll tell you. No, I, I, I actually, I really do have to go because I got to go back to the store here and talk to this guy. But you know, Maurice, I, yeah, fun. I, I love Maurice Lamarche. Period. End well, of story. Let me just put it this. Let me just say one last thing. Pinky, are you pondering what I'm pondering? Well, I think so, Brain. But if Jack's black and Betty's white, is Marvin gay? No. <laughs> Why not? That's funny. That's funny. Thank you. Well, it's funny, lady.